All right, welcome along to the RT Soccer Podcast. Raf Giallo here, and this week I'm joined again by ex-UCD Shamrock Rovers and Sheffield Wednesday midfielder Paul Carey and also journalist Jonathan Higgins. We're going to be joined by Conan Byrne a little bit later on, and that's when we're going to start talking about some of the uh, domestic matters, including uh, congratulations that have to be sent to the Shelburne women's team who have won their league, and also Shamrock Rovers who got to lift the trophy, the SSE Electricity League Premier Division trophy at Tala Stadium on Sunday after the game against Derry City. But while we wait for Conan let's start on Liverpool we had Champions League action live on RT2 and RT player last night and it was Liverpool's 2-0 win over Napoli and it comes off the back of a fairly damaging defeat to Leeds at the weekend and obviously the weekend before that they'd lost to Nottingham Forest so let's just listen to Dietmar Hamann who was speaking on our coverage after the game last night just about how much you can read into this particular result against Napoli with a big game against Tottenham to come. Do you think they can close that gap and get into the top four by the season's end? Well they I'm not sure they can can close they should close it uh, it doesn't really matter whether they finish fifth or, or seventh. I don't know whether Europa League uh, uh, brings them that much forward financially and as a club. Um, you know, they they just got to carry on and, and, and carry on their the good work and take that, that, that win into Sunday's game. Mm. Uh, what they must not do is overestimate what they did today. Yes, they beat a very good team, but it was a dead rubber. Napoli knew they're going to win the group if they lose by two, three goals. So they knew what, what they needed to do to win the group, which is very important. Um, don't overestimate it, don't get carried away, but yeah. it was a, a step in the right de- direction, but a, a very small one. All right, Jonathan. And I think Conan Byrne has actually just joined us as well. Um, hello, Conan. <laughs> Raf, sorry, I got on a bit early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we we were uh, we were going to wait and talk about the domestic action a little bit later on, but uh, anyway, we're starting on Liverpool. So just there, we played a clip of Deep Marhama and just talking about how much you can or cannot read into the two 0 win over Napoli. And I might start with you, Jonathan. Actually, um, from watching the game last night and off the back of very up and down form, and then when we're reading into this going into the Spurs game, then on Sunday, how much do you take out of this match against Napoli? Because as Dietmar Hamann said there, it is somewhat of a dead rubber. I think he's hit the nail on the head with, with this one here. Um, I had very little really to get excited about in the general course of things. Obviously, it was good to get the victory. Uh, Napoli had this unbeaten record uh, coming with them, but by and large, if, you know, I think they had one real chance of note, the one that had the long bar check for, for the offside. Um, there's still many facets of the Liverpool game and the performance last night that have to be improved a lot and they still the look the goals were were good and all that and they give a bit of loss and maybe it's the kind of clutching for straws mentality in in a small bit of trying to build on any sort of positive momentum but two tapping goals for, from set pieces um decent enough performance at times but for me it was large periods of the game, large performances of the game from key players again that were just off the boil a bit. And um, Fabinho still in the middle field is still a big problem. How he got away with so many of those late ch- challenges last night um, it is beyond me. He he was so off the pace at, at times. Uh, Curtis Jones looked a bit lost at times. I know he's coming back from injury, but I don't know. I'm still not convinced in this isn't me saying it after this performance. Has he that next step to go all the way? I think Ronnie Whelan again nailed it last night when he said he just takes too many touches at, at times. Uh, um, and particularly with the way the style of Liverpool are is to pretty much the, the midfield is almost uh, water carries at times. Just get it forward to the front men and when he's taken extra touches, you know, there's a caveat there. He is only come back from injury. But still, there wasn't. Look, it's great to get the result. It's it's a bit of you know something to latch onto, but overall, yeah, look, there's a lot more in the right direction. I suppose Nunes is probably the the shining light that he comes on, and he's just a crazy bananas, mad player almost. Uh, like he, it's just impossible to describe him. Like he has, look, you you look at him, and you know you take the stats away from the game. He's big, tick. He's strong, tick. He has a bit of skill, a bit of class, tick. But there's just stuff that he does at times. Like, he was playing well, and I even text one of my mates, look, Jesus, he's playing well now. Then he clips a lad across the back of the ear from a corner, and you get booked, and you're like, here, here we go again. But he did he did play quite well, and uh, you can see small little little tweaks to the game and in terms of com- coming through, like he made a bust down the left wing. And rather than it wasn't the Man City one again where he had Salah sitting all alone and he went, to, went for the glory, he did cross, and it was a wonderful challenge uh, in the end. But he's just... 
he, he's a player that you know maybe there's a little bit of when Drogba first came he, uh, Chelsea and you know he was a bit you know he came in from France and uh, was a bit all over the place and then clicked maybe there's a little bit with this but uh, at times you just have to laugh at him but he, he was uh, a little positive when he came on yeah, I heard somebody chuckling in the background there about Darwin Nunes or what Jonathan just said there, but uh, I'm not sure which one of you it is. But in fairness, the other game then um, uh, that was ongoing at the same time as the Liverpool game, of course, was Spurs playing against Marseille and Spurs don't make it easy for themselves. That's two weeks in a row, uh, two weeks in a row now in the group stage matches where there's been late drama. And obviously it cost them the previous week, Paul. This week, though, um, it worked out quite nicely for them. Yeah, the group was was mental enough, Raf. Um, it was one where the the top two spots for going through were, were very much up in the air before they kicked off last night. And Spurs were absolutely dreadful in the first half. They sat in, they invited Marseille on. <clears throat> Major question marks about how Conte had them set up because it just it was anonymous that that Marseille were, were going to score at some point in the first half with the amount of pressure they were putting themselves under. They went behind, and to be fair to them, they they regrouped. They came out the second half and uh, they looked a, a far, far better team. Um, the goal, obviously, from Longley, uh, set piece kind of settled the nerves and they seemed to have a good enough steer and a good enough control on the game there. But Kalasinic, the ex-Arsenal player, missed an absolute sitter with about three minutes to go. And if he had scored that, Tottenham were out of the Champions League. And, um, you know, only riding their bitter luck, um, they were extremely, extremely fortunate to get through. And it, it ended up working out very nicely for them because Hoiberg's gone down with the last kick of the game and he scored and that put them through top of the group and that's going to be vitally important because if you look at the teams that Liverpool can play finishing second in the group versus the teams that Tottenham will play, it, it makes your road to the quarterfinals so much easier. But still major question marks about how Tottenham set up. You can kind of hear discontent when you speak to Tottenham fans about how negative their setup is under Conte. They, you know, the five at the back is very much five at the back. The wing backs don't seem to be playing in that final third and Harry Kane, Son, Richarlison, Akulazeski, whoever that might be, at times looked very, very isolated up there. So it was an important win for, for their progression. It was probably an important win because they've had some dodgy results in the last couple of weeks. They were lucky. They were very, very lucky, Ralph. Yeah, and uh, Conan, for this Sunday now, uh, as Spurs take on Liverpool, like, what's your reading in terms of how this is likely to play out? Obviously, Liverpool are probably going to dominate possession, given what we've seen as Spurs, who are quite passive, until they're sort of made to play when they fall behind. You don't know what to expect, Raf, this season, especially from Liverpool. Um, four wins at Anfield, but they haven't won away from away from home all season as well. Um. I think Conte being Conte and the tac- and how tactically aware he is, although, as Paul mentioned yesterday, I don't think he was more, uh, tactically astute last night, um, that he'll target Trent. Um, and I think that's been the main ploy this season from a lot of managers. He's been targeted more and more. And I think the reason behind it being kind of a problem this year is that they're not scoring the other end of the pitch. It was a case that if Liverpool scored more than you, well, that's that's great. It's not happening anymore. I think the loss of Mane has been has has been really, really key. Um, Nunes, the pressure that he has put himself since he has joined Liverpool has seeped through the team. Um, and they've been really poor. Salah's poor, poor form. I know he's scoring a few goals now over the last number of games, which is fantastic for Liverpool. Um but we'll flip it then to Spurs, who were going, going to be on the back of a fantastic victory last night. As like how um, how that Marseille player missed that chance at the end is beyond me. Um, I'm not going to pronounce it because Paul Curry can do it much better than me. But um, it's how he missed that chance. It's it's guilt edge just to put your team through to the to the Champions League, and um, he misses it. And then the other end of the pitch, they're still true, and they they commit so many players forward and. And uh, Harry Kane lays a crop, lays a ball into Hoiberg, who, who slots it. A fantastic finish. Um, but it's 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 for the game coming up on Sunday. It's just so hard to call what's going to happen because the two teams, obviously Spurs, on the back of a fantastic victory today, as I said, but domestically they haven't been as um, I don't know as compact at the back, and their attacking threat isn't what it what it used to be either. So um, it's going to be a very interesting game. 
Yeah, we'll come back to the Champions League and Premier League a little bit later on, and of course we're going to have the draw um, on RTE, so keep uh, keep an eye out for that for the for the last sixteen. But we're going to turn our attention to domestic matters, and of course we we will be previewing the women's FAI Cup final a little bit later on. Shelburne taking on Aplone, and that's going to be live on RT two and the RT player as well. And of course Shelburne are coming into it as league champions, and Aplone also had a really brilliant season. So we'll come to all that a little bit later on, but. Uh, this weekend in the SSE or Trish League Premier Division, a lot of things were settled. Now, previously last week when we were recording, Paul, it was a case where we sort of, Shamrock Rovers had one full hand on the trophy and about three fingers, I think, on it, just one little finger that Derry City could have prized oh. off. But of course, uh, uh, they, um, sl- the match in Sligo, uh, at Sligo, the Derry City played, sort of settled that. And then uh, Shamrock Rovers got to lift the trophy. But uh, we'll, we'll come to Rovers a little bit later on because there were other matters settled as well. Third place settled, Dundalk beating Bohemians 2-1. Shelburne warming up for their own cup final, a 6-0 win over Drada United. Sligo Rovers beating St. Pat's 1-0, which is obviously related to the uh, Tundalk result as well there. And then what we're going to start off on is the battle at the bottom. So Finn Harps losing 3-1 at home to UCD. And let's just listen to Ollie Horgan first, who was speaking to journalist Chris, Chris Ashmore after that defeat um, in Donegal. Yeah, I think you've been complimentary about thin margins. Uh, yeah, there was thin margins there tonight and several other nights, but over the course of the season, there's also a lie, Chris, and uh, we had, we probably had several opportunities to kick out of the bottom one, if you like, and uh, we didn't take them. I mean, you know, to be fair to UCD there to, tonight, they fully and utterly deserve to win it. They've beaten us three times out of four, and all we can do is congratulate them and wish them well in the playoffs with Andy and Willie and we've you know there's you, you know we've had great nights here where we won modestly and we certainly will take a royal and we've no one to blame by ourselves uh, in that manner it's not like that had that been the winning goal with the penalty decision against Conor Torres which was atrocious had that been the winning goal well then we might have had another you know cut off it I mean as I said to Neil Doyle probably they weren't good enough the referees all season but we certainly weren't either it was always going to be tough. The turnover of players pre-season was massive. Um, you brought in a lot of new faces, but in some ways you were you were struggling almost from the word go. Yeah, we we probably the intention would have been to try and you know get better as the season went along, and there were patches where we did get better, but we fell short, like a two-one defeat or a one-nil defeat against the better sides or the sides higher up the table. And that was really the, 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 maybe the fault of it. No, we'd several opportunities. Like, to put it this way to you, I'd say UCD were delighted that we were there and we probably were delighted that they were there to keep each other company because if it was another season, we might have been relegated weeks ago. However, last year, 20 points would have got you to the playoff because Langford only finished, I think, in 14. So probably as horses for courses, but results don't lie. Uh, was the writing on the wall? Not really, no. We felt that we could get, if you like, a short-term kick out of the players. But unfortunately, we went one up there tonight and we didn't get the ball back to lose one all. And that's probably where we didn't manage that game tonight. And there were several examples of that during the season. It is very raw. Uh, and no doubt there'll be a, a time of reflection before you decide uh, uh, Chris, on things. Chris, there's something about me. Uh, the club the club was here years before me, be here years after me, whenever that may be. Um, Look, I, I walked away last year and, and, and people who, who I admire within the board asked me to stay and to try and put a team together to try and stay in the division and we fell short on that. Uh, you know, I knew last year and I said it, uh, it was, if this was about me, I'd have ran a mile, but I didn't. It was about the club and it's a hell of a lot bigger, you know, the club than me. Managers come and go, you know, board members come and go, but supporters say the same and to be fair to them, uh, Chris, Tonight again, they had several opportunities where they could have turned on us over the season and they didn't. And of all years, you know, look, they, they saw what, what the players or what we try and put into it. But I think this year, uh, you know, I, I have huge pride in them. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to win them over or anything like that. That day is years ago, it's gone. But, you know, maybe, maybe tonight and all season at home, there was a lot of pride there and there was a huge connection with them, especially when we weren't going well. 
and I think they, they, they're hurting tonight and by God I'm hurting here trying to put a brave face in it but I've got to and I will and look we're as tough as nails Chris but it's hurting and there's no point in pretending anything different Okay so that is Finn Harps manager Ollie Horgan candid as always and uh, of course they've been now relegated down to the first division after that defeat against UCD UCD are going to go into the uh, promotion relegation playoff and it's either going to be Galway United or Waterford to come for them but from Finn Harps point of view Conan I mean I think Ollie, and um, speaking to my colleague Connor Neville at the start of the season, just before it kicked off, he had flagged that this was going to be the toughest season he had in charge since they came back up, and so it proved. And maybe even results like the the one on Friday night might have been one that would have gone their way previously, especially at home, a tough place to go, and just the you know the percentages just weren't there this season that maybe were there previously. Yeah, Raf, <clears throat> you mentioned there it was a tough place to go, and it has been over the years been a very tough place to go but they haven't made it a fortress this season they've three wins in 18 games culminating in only 13 points from a possible 54 um, last year they got they, they picked up 21 points and if they had a, had the same form as last year they'd be above UCD going into this last round of games so yeah I think look there's a lot of different reasons behind their relegation I think Dave Webster it was a massive loss when, at centre back um, with his injuries that, that with the, with his injury that that he picked up, um, but also I mentioned the home form there. The, the away form was absolutely abysmal altogether. Um, one win in eighteen, <coughs> excuse me, one win in eighteen games, whereas they had six wins last year in 2021, 23 points from a possible fifty four last season, and only seven points away from home this season. So those are the stats, though, and and they don't lie. Um, so their home form wasn't good enough. Their away form, away form certainly wasn't good enough. And over the years, as I've mentioned, Bally Buffet was the was was the fortress. It was a very very difficult place to go and 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 win to be very compact. But every year he just seems to try and rebuild a team. It's similar to Bow Bohemians. Um, but because it's in Donegal, it's very very hard to to entice players to that area of the country so you're asking uh, people to come um, to travel from Dublin likes of Dave Webster um, who we made captain and then relying on players that maybe that I, and I've said this plenty of times before this league is very very difficult to come into and just play you can be very very good technically but it doesn't mean that you're going to be successful um, and he has brought in some good players Mihailovic has been absolutely has been excellent Um He's brought in Rob Jones as well during the summer, who, who was a handful. Talking to a couple of defenders, they, they, they thought he was a real handful playing against them. Um, but you need more. And unfortunately, it wasn't enough for Finn Harps. Yeah, and it, this relegation, uh, Paul, comes at a time where they are um, involved in a stadium development uh, in terms of the kind of off the pitch and the growth of the club. And it's something the chairman, Ian Harkin, has descri described as a game changer. So... In terms of what happens next, in terms of them trying to bounce back, obviously Ollie Horgan didn't really allude to what his what the future may hold. He did sort of allude to the fact he he might have gone uh, prior to this season had it not been for members of the board who he appreciates who um you know talked him into staying. But it, it does look like it is crucial, especially what he's done there previously, that they are able to keep hold of him and see can they kind of bounce back up with him because he has shown an ability to do that previously. Yeah, and that might be something, Raf, that that keeps Ollie on board there is is that whole stadium build and whether or not that's gonna kind of pick up momentum and and be pushed through over the next couple of years. And it, it certainly feels like that's needed. And um, the facilities are badly in need of of being touched up. Um, in Bally Buffet, and maybe that'll be something that will kickstart the club on an upward trajectory. Because for the last couple of years, if we're being brutally honest about it, Finn Harps have have offered very, very little um, to the league. I think Ollie Horgan has been superb. He's been very loyal to the club and he's been, you know, highly entertaining for, for a neutral looking in. But if you look at kind of the players that they've produced or um, the seasons that they've put together, they haven't offered a huge amount. And uh, it certainly feels that like uh, a change in the infrastructure and a, a better of the facilities up there would maybe kickstart it. Because if you look at the teams that are coming up, like Cork are in a much better position than Finn Harps are. And if, if Waterford were maybe to go and progress and beat Galway and then beat UCD, well, they're another full-time setup with much better facilities than, than the likes of a Finn Harps. So they always seem to be playing catch-up. They've always punched above their weight. But if if they are to maybe take that next step, it certainly feels that something needs to to ignite there and maybe a stadium rebuild and, and 
improving the facilities around the club would, would be of benefit to them. Yeah, and then on the other side of it, obviously, UCD going into the promotion relegation playoff now. And, uh, I mean, a lot of people would have maybe uh, uh, backed them to go down at the at the start of the season that Finn Harps would, based on previous experience, would have enough in hand to maybe just pit them. But it's a great achievement for them, Paul. 100%. And, and they've come good at the right time. You know, they've picked up seven points in their last three games. That win against Strada was vitally important. Um, the point against Shells kind of added to their confidence. And I was still fearful of that game against Finn Harps. I, I think we were talking recently, Raf, and I said it, it just, it smelt of a rainy night in Bally Buffet and UCD giving away some some easy goals. And it certainly started that way. If you look at the goal they conceded, it was a, a straightforward enough set piece. And you feared for them once they went behind. But the the goal from Mark Dignam from, from 30 yards was so important. I think it was it was the guts of like 45 seconds after they conceded. So that would have built their confidence. And in Tommy Lonergan, they've got somebody who's banging form and he took both the penalty and his goal extremely well. So it, it's very impressive from Andy Myler taking into consideration that he lost Colin Wien and he lost Kerrigan, the two players that everybody was talking about early on in the season. And they have come good at the right time. There's still a lot of work to do. I think whether it be Galway, or whether it be Waterford, it's going to be a difficult um, proposition for UCD. But with the form they're showing in recent weeks, I'm sure they'll fancy themselves to to give either of those sides a good a good matchup. Yeah, and then in the battle to finish third, Dundalk, uh, with the result uh, against Bohemians, then on Friday have secured that place. And Pat's losing at Sligo Rovers. We'll have to wait and see. Can Derry City do them a favour in the FAI Cup final? But uh, Conan, just on the two sides here. So you know we've we've seen Dundalk season uh, as it's progressed. There's been up, ups and downs. Stephen O'Donnell's first campaign, and then his former club now Pat's as well have had sort of like a mix of moments of great consistency, like a great run just after they got knocked out of Europe and uh, sort of inconsistency before that. So where does it leave both clubs? And especially, say, if Pats were to miss out on Europe based off of maybe Shelburne winning the Cup, where does it leave both clubs? Yeah, it's disappointing. I think it's a it's a poor season from St. Pats, if I'm being totally honest, to finish fourth. They're currently 18 points behind Shamrock Rowers. Um, and yeah, it's, it's not ideal, obviously. Um, they had a great run after... Uh, the CSKA Sophia defeat in Tala. Um, and even through that European run, they, they did really, really well. And the emergence of some players at the club has been has been fantastic to see. Like Joe Redden has gone in, he's captain, youngest captain in Europe for Pats. He's been absolutely superb, under 21, played brilliantly in the Israel game. Um, Adam O'Reilly at the centre of the park. I know he's on loan from Preston North End, but I think his energy has been vital for St. Pats when Jamie Lennon got injured. And even when Jamie came back, the two of them were were excellent in the midfield. Um, but it's up top where I thought they could have done, where, where they haven't really fired on all cylinders. I know Owen Doyle got double figures, um, but the players around them, I think, could have contributed more. Obviously, we know Chris Forrester has been uh, has been absolutely superb, and he is. Um, but the players around them, I think, needed to step up a little bit. Atakai did okay, scored a couple of important goals um, in the latter part of the season when he came in from Finland. But... Um, I think like the players around them, you need to you need to get goals, and there there just wasn't enough. And to lose eleven games, and finish fourth, isn't a good return at all. And in fairness to Dundalk, I think Stevie O'Donnell went in there hoping to just get a mid table position, start the rebuild, but it, it's uh, it's worked out wonders for him. And he mentioned himself in his in his post match interview after the game in Oriel Park that it was a, a monumental achievement to finish third and to get Europe next season. And it is. It's a fantastic achievement, um, and I'm sure that 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 club will only get bigger now. And there's a bit of a financial um, power behind them now as well. So um, they'll be up there, and a lot of people are forgetting that. So they're not to talk about Shamrock Rovers and Derry for the next couple of years. You, you can't write off Dundalk, especially if if they get good recruitment now in the off season as well. So um, yeah, joy for for people up in Dundalk, but. Um, as you say, St. Pat's relying on Derry City to beat Shelburne to, to make Europe again. And if they don't, it's a very, very poor season. Yeah, and Shelburne, uh, from their point of view, also building towards that cup final where they're going to be the underdogs, but a 6-0 win over Drada United. Um, their form, um, I think we've mentioned it a, a couple of times here, Paul, it has been it has been pretty good, actually, even if the results maybe haven't necessarily shown it. 
but uh, their performances have definitely picked up and it bodes well for their uh, for what is going to be a tough game against Derry City in the final. Yeah, and it's going to be a very difficult fixture against Derry, given the form that they've shown in the in the latter half of the season, Raf. Um, but yeah, I mean their their form has been has been patchy enough with regards to the results that they've picked up, and I'm sure Damien Duff would have rather that they they didn't lose so many games along the way that they have done, and I'm sure that will be an area that he'll he'll look to to maybe improve on next year, having lost 14 of their 35 games within the league. I think what you alluded to there, though, is vitally important. Like the performances have gradually gotten better as the season's gone on. You can see the structure that they're playing within. You can see that everybody has a certain understanding of what is expected of them within their respective positions. And I think the players, naturally enough, have, have grown and progressed, particularly the likes two players that come to mind, Jack Moylan and Sean Boyd uh, in the top half of the pitch have, have certainly shown good form and have shown that they... Um, that they belong, I guess, first and foremost in this division and that they can offer a lot to that Shelburne team. So it'll be those types of players, particularly in that final third, that they will that they will lean on. Both were on the score sheet against Drogheda the other night. And I'm sure that Damien Duff has already begun to, to think about what bodies and what faces he's going to add into that squad for next year because if they can continue to progress, if they can add a bit more quality into their squad, they'll start, certainly start to at least push the teams above them, the likes of Bowes, the likes of Sligo, to close the gap between them. And nothing, I guess, would would add uh, petrol onto the fire more than a, a cup win and people wanting to be part of that journey and just give everybody within the club a huge boost of confidence. European football would also be massive with regards to the finances. So, you can certainly see what it is they're about. They have a bit of a gap to go to actually close with the with the teams in the top half of the table. But one thing that you would say is that the performances have certainly improved from, from the first week of the season when they played St. Pat's and it looked as if they were almost naive. There's a certain confidence and there's a structure that those players are playing within at this moment in time. Yeah, and coincidentally, they are playing Pats on Sunday in the final round of fixtures in the league, and then Derry City also hosting uh, Dundalk. And Derry City, as I said, they were at Tallis Stadium to play Shamrock Rovers. Now, obviously, the league was out of the question at this point, and it was a night where Shamrock Rovers win, lose, or draw. We're going to be lifting the trophy anyway, as they did. And it was also a lovely moment uh, as well with uh, young Josh Bradley getting to lift the trophy with them. Uh, Conan, I mean, um, as I think has been well documented, he's been he's he's had an illness. And as uh, his and we'll we'll play a clip of uh, his his dad and the manager Stephen Bradley very very shortly. But um, as he pointed out, that there was something young Josh had been looking forward to um, as soon as uh, it was kind of confirmed they were going to win the league and to have that sort of moment after everything he's been through. Absolutely, Rafa. I have a daughter of the same age as Josh, and. I'm. I'm. I always try and put myself into other people's positions, um, and just to, to try and show some, to have some empathy and to, to, to feel something. But I don't know how he's got through the season, Raf. Um, for everything that has gone on, and um, both on the pitch, but obviously off it as well. Um, it's just incredible, absolutely incredible for for a man to be able to to go about his business, um. And to get another league winning team um, and the squad of players that he would have had to manage really, really well. Um, and then to go home from training every single day to fight another battle with his son is um, is truly extraordinary. And um, it just goes to show the togetherness that that team has. He asked them to win the league for Josh and they've done that in spades. And, and um, another like 10 points clear of second place um, one defeat in fifteen, they um in the league twenty nine games without defeat at home and at home at Tala, um th- th- like it's it's incredible what Stephen Bradley and his backroom team have done and, and I think special credit must be given to the likes of Stephen McPhail, Glenn Cronin as well and 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 all the backroom team, um because it is a team effort but there is one man that sits on that pedestal and who who is there to be shot at, and um he's had a bit of negative publicity I suppose in terms of his European adventures but um, truth be told they're, they're still a bit off on that they did really really well to to get to where they are they managed to pick up a couple of points but they did what they needed to do and that's to to, to win the league again to have another go at Europe next year and um, hats off to Stephen Bradley because it's a, a, a massive achievement for him 
Yeah, let's listen to him here. He was speaking to Tony O'Donoghue after the full-time whistle in Tala on Sunday. Stephen, what has this moment meant to you? Ah, it's an incredibly special moment, Tony. Um, I asked the players when when my son got ill, could they could they win this trophy for him? And uh, they've done that for us, and uh, it's a special night for him, for the club, obviously, for everyone involved. But uh, for him, he's had a tough time, and this is a special night for him. Was he overwhelmed by it all? It was a beautiful moment with the, the team, the staff, the fans, and Josh. Uh, I'm sure he was a bit, to be honest, but uh, he's all, it's all he's been talking about since he's been sick is can we go and, and lift the trophy for him? So I'm absolutely delighted that he's had that moment tonight and uh, that'll give him the lift that he needs to go and fight the rest of this. Absolutely, and we all wish you and him that everything goes well, and I'm sure it will. Uh, but tonight, your team did for you again what they've been doing all season, dug in and showed their consistency, unbeaten here, incredible. Yeah, incredible, because it's not easy. We played on tours, they obviously in a tough game. We're down bodies, but this group don't look for excuses. They don't want excuses. That's why they're the best in the country, and they have been, so uh, hats off them, fantastic. You've talked about not just four, but, but five. Obviously, you have to get the four first. Like, this is a legacy. This is a history, history moment, really. Yeah, it is, but we're not finished. Um, the aim is to put two stars in on the jersey, and now can we go and uh, beat that famous team of, uh, of the 80s? And it's going to be tough. We know teams are coming, but uh, we'll do our very best to do it. It's a very special night here, isn't it? Incredible. Unbelievable to see sold out um, Tallis Stadium. Massive thank you to the fans for respecting uh, the ceremony and allowing Josh and the kids to be on the pitch. Massive thank you to them for that. Uh, this is their nice, so thank you. It was a beautiful moment and well deserved. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. So that is Stephen Bradley, Shamrock Rovers manager, speaking to Tony O'Donoghue live on RT2 as we had that game and the 1 0 win over Derry City um, live on RT2 and the RT player. Um, Paul, next steps for the hoops, as, as, as uh, Stephen Bradley said there, it's going for the four in a row and trying to match the historic team of the past but um, they're, you know Derry City uh, who they did beat are going to be hot on their heels and uh, Dundalk as uh, Conan has already mentioned are also going to probably make a step forward especially with European um, with the, the finances from European football on top of it as well so it's only going to get harder so what do they need to do in terms of continuing the progression they've been on? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what Stephen Bradley does in the off season. <clears throat> I mean, they're going to lose Andy Lyons to Blackpool, and he's been somebody who's who's really stood up to the mark for them this year in, in that wing back position. I was listening to the fans there, and he noticed it, saying one more year to Alan Manis, and that's that's vitally important that they keep him there because he's arguably had his his best year at the club. So there's probably a couple of positions I'm sure that he'll want to to nail down and, and keep personnel and make sure that they're still in the building come preseason next year. But I'm sure he'll want to maybe keep it fresh um, with regards to bringing in some newer faces. There's a couple of players there who are 30 and above, and I'm sure with regards to to keeping that appetite and energy within the squad, he might you'll look to bring some younger faces through, whether it be from, from the academy in the 19s or, or maybe some of the top talent from some of the other clubs. If you think, you know, naturally enough, they've they've gone to UCD a couple of times to to add to the squad with the likes of Scales Ferruccia and Gary O'Neill wouldn't be all surprised to see if they if they did that um come January or come the, the mid-season break. So keeping things fresh is vitally important. But I don't think you want to disrupt things too much, Raf. Uh, I think he'll show a lot of loyalty to those players. They've been incredibly uh, good to Stephen Bradley with the performances that they've shown within the domestic league and also within Europe. But what's probably uh, the biggest testament to Stephen Bradley is you never hear of any discontent within within all those players. He has a difficult job juggling all those all those players. At times, he's have to leave Dylan Watts out, Richie Taylor out, Graham Burke, Jack Byrne. There's only so many players that he can play in those central positions. And they all seem to be delighted with, with how things have gone. So he'll show, I'm sure, an incredible amount of loyalty. But just to ensure that they keep that gap between themselves and Dundalk and Derry, I'm sure he'll look to bring in one or two over the course of the next 12 months just to keep things fresh. Yeah, and they also have their final Euro- Europa Conference League game uh, to come in the group, and that's against Jurgoren in Sweden, Conan. So um, last week's game, they drew 1-1 with Ghent, and it was a good performance. Unfortunately, then there was the red card for Justin Ferris, or well, the second yellow um, for Justin Ferris, who, uh, who had come on a little bit earlier on. And what did you? What improvement did you see against Ghent that maybe had been missing in some of the uh, earlier group games? And 
again, now that they're going away from home against an already qualified Jurgorn, which may play into Rovers' favour, how do you think they should approach it? Because some of the away performances have been have been difficult uh, in this group so far. I think the experience has told a lot, Raf, in from previous games. Like they've played a lot of European games this season, and I think the penny has dropped with them in terms of how uh, how to set up, how to stay organised, how that when because they're not used to it domestically, where teams come at them and, and have those large uh, spells of possession, and how to deal with that. So I think they've managed that particularly well against Ghent, um, against Ghent last week. Um, but like what I'd, I know we're, I was talking to you before, Raf, on, on this before, I, and I said that your garden was, was possibly the best team in the group. Um, Gary Rogers disagreed with me at the time. Um, but because they are a fantastic side filled with very, very good players, and they've proved that over in this group stages. Now that they're true, it's an opportunity for their manager to to give other other uh, players opportunities. So it could be a chance for Stephen Bradley to pick up more points. Um, there's a team to pick up more points and more financial reward for them at that as well. Um, but as you said there, their away form has been really, really poor. But it's a last game for some of, like as Paul said, it's going to be a last game for, for Andy Lyons. Um, and they're going to want to, put, to, to, to go out in a high, especially with the season that they've had. Um, so yeah, I, I I expect them to to compete better than they have done it away from home. From Derry City's point of view, obviously they're trying to build to a cup final now, and as we've alluded to here uh, many times, silverware is going to be huge for them in terms of their overall progression. So, from what you saw against Shamrock Rovers, how are they building um, for that game against Shelburne in a couple of weeks? Yeah, I thought they were in almost second or third gear the other night, Raph. I'm not sure they were going a full tilt, and that's understandable given the fixture that that awaits them at the end of the season against Shelburne and the Aviva. I think naturally enough, they just need to keep those key players fit. Michael Duffy and Patrick McElhenney, since they've come back into that team, have, have certainly given them an extra gear, and keeping them fit next year, combine them with the likes of Patching Dummigan and Diallo, they've got a really good foundation there. It's just about adding one or two more, really, Raph. Um, keeping the cohort of that team strong, keeping them fit and keeping them together and then just look to maybe bring in one or two more bodies to kind of close that gap and, and push them on a bit more. But they've certainly shown, particularly in the second half of the season, that they've got more than enough to at least close that gap and push Shamrock Rovers next year. We're going to turn our attentions now to the first division playoffs. Of course, uh, Watford and Galway have made their way through. They're going to be playing each other on Friday after beating Treaty United and Longford Town, respectively, over two legs. And Conan, looking at the fixture on Friday, I mean, it looks like it's going to be a clash of two styles. Yeah, you could say that. Yeah, um, like I think everyone's fascination with Waterford's front three is is justified. Um, Wasim Ewatria is has come in from Charlton. Um, has done really well. Seven goals and twelve starts. Very very good player. Obviously, Junior Caterna as well. He's got ten goals this season. But I think the all the talk is about Phoenix Patterson and what he can do. Um, both from open play and from set pieces as well. He just he's just so dangerous. Um, twenty goals this season in the league, um, including his his couple against uh, Treaty as well. So, yeah, it's 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 nearly going to be a clash of the two defenses if I'm if I'm being honest, because you have those three for Waterford that are playing really really well, and then you have a makeshift left back that have, that has played up front for Galway. Well, in the ten and up front at at very and wide, he's played nearly every position for Galway this season. Stephen Walsh. He's got 16 goals. And I remember playing against Stephen a couple of years ago. I would never have said in a million years that he would be a goal scorer. Um, and he's done so, so well over the last number of years since John Caulfield has come in. He's, and John brought in jo- Joe Manley as well. Or Rob Manley. I keep getting the brothers mixed up. Um, Rob Manley has come in and has done really, really well. He's got seven goals this season too. So, And then Dave Hurley in the middle of the park. Very, very good player. I'm playing against him at Cove a couple of years ago when he was young. And I mentioned to... Um, Ian Morris at the time, the manager, to say, try and get him to to Dublin. He's a very, very good player. Um, so he's got, he's full time football now in Galway, doing really, really well. So yeah, I just think that with both attacking threats that both teams have, yes, different styles of play. One more direct route up to Rob Manley and and Stephen Walsh. The other intru- intricate play through the middle. Um, so it's going to be a very interesting game, really is, and and uh, they they haven't been. Um, 
there hasn't been much difference between the sides this season. Um, two wins for Galway, a win for Waterford, and a two-all draw back in March as well. So Galway have the upper hand a little bit, but um, in terms of previous me- meetings. But since Danny has come in to the Waterford role, Galway haven't won. Um, Galway haven't beaten them. So it'll be a very interesting game now when um, on Friday at, at Markets Field. And I'm really, really looking forward to it. I do think, though, that Waterford will will come out on top. Um, but we'll wait and see. Yeah, and Jonathan, what's the mood in Galway? I mean, obviously at the start of the season, they were a lot closer to Cork City, who obviously got automatically promoted and then found themselves slipping back in terms of form. We kind of discussed a little bit last week before the, the two legs against Longford, but uh, what's the sense uh, from Galwegians in the in the lead-up to this game? Yeah, it was an amazing atmosphere down in Turland on Sunday afternoon, particularly with the two late goals as well, because... The second half performance was really, really good as well from Galway. They had a number of opportunities and you were still kind of the little bit of negative guy inside you with just a one goal advantage. You would take a set piece because Galway had been so on top. But then the late goals just added a bit of bounce and the place was absolutely rocking afterwards. And, and I couldn't help but get flashbacks for three years, or three weeks previously to the Athlone game where I've never seen so many people leave down the dike road afterwards. I was depressed in our life. That defeat to Athlone the manner of it, it was doom, gloom. It just was kind of the, the top of the mountain in terms of that kind of blip of form with the title charge completely went off the rails. But um, the Sunday Sunday was really special. It was, uh, I suppose, if you could, if you can like get the perfect scenario of building confidence prior to such a big game like this, it probably was. Good performance in Wednesday night up in Bishopsgate. Longford probably started a little better. You could definitely see the two distinctive styles in Longford bit more tippy-tappy passing around. Clark was amazing on the right wing and in the first half created both goals, created another opportunity for Eddie Amo. They came off the post. But Galway just got to, grip, got to grips in the second half and they really, really went for it at the end. And you can, you've touched on players there in good form, but Mikey Rowe deserves a shout-out as well. Playing against his old team now as well, three goals in the month. He's been really, really good. Um, Just brings, I suppose he's kind of like a typical John Caulfield midfielder. He's He's so energetic. He will run all day for you, kind of can play in a number of different positions as well. But look, even the most biased Galway supporters, you look at that Waterford attack, you look at the amount of goals they've scored, 70 this season, not including the playoffs. To, what is it, 56 for Galway? You add in another five in the playoffs. But the only thing that will give you a little bit of hope is kind of the half time of the, of the game on Saturday between Treaty when they were 3 and went, three, one up and maybe asked a couple of question marks. But you have to kind of Marcus Field seems to be getting narrower by the the last time I was down there. They seem to have brought it in a bit more. Uh, it, it'll be interesting if it stays in the same narrow type. It'll probably suit Galway a little bit more, particularly with um, Killian Bruder's throws now really really creating a lot of trouble. And he seems to have lowered them down maybe half a yard or so. So they're coming in like absolute rockets now. The the second goal. Um, again in Wednesday night in Bishopsgate actually came from a kind of a he took one and then the ball went out and he just absolutely launched it without, without thinking it Manley got the flick on and then Rowe put it Manley in good form as well putting a bit of kind of getting a bit of fitness getting a bit of uh, did really well when he came on aside from the, the goal also so there is there is options there but you know you look at that attack but all the games by and large have been close you know you go back to the start of the season that game in March that's where Walshy came alive at, at the start at the kind of this new striker role for Back to the strikers' role, he had obviously played there previously with Johnny Glynn uh, for United a good while ago. But he came on at half time in that game, went up front and was a revelation and has been a revelation there for the for the end of, until now until the end of the season. Games have been so tight. You think back to the games down in the RC, the the one 0 with Dimas back earlier in the year. Then the, Waterford had the, the victory down there. A couple of decisions from the officials that I think John uh, John and the the staff are still a little bit unrest by, but. Waterford have been good form, and as you said, on since since Danny's come in charge, they look a little bit different. The firepower, I think, it's going to be a fascinating game Friday night. Um, you just hope that I know already. You hear there's huge crowds from both sides, so many buses from both sets of supporters um, booked up, and more on the way. It seems so. It should be a great atmosphere, uh, and just hope it's a good game. And I think whoever comes out has a real good chance against UCD as well the following week. But uh, you won't look past uh, Friday night first. Yeah, and just to mention as well, uh, Longford Town looking for a new manager, Gary Cronin stepping down. But just what Jonathan said there, Paul, um, in terms of uh, both either side that gets through would have a good chance uh, against UCD. I think everybody wants to avoid, or UCD want to avoid Waterford at this moment in time. I mean, the form that they've shown in in the league, but not only that, I mean, some of the results they had in the FAI Cup would 
would make you believe that Galway is probably a, a bit of an easier fixture for UCD. I think UCD probably favour playing against a team who are maybe a bit more uh, conservative in their approach or maybe sit back a bit and let UCD have the ball. That would probably favour them a bit more. And I think naturally enough, they would want to avoid Phoenix Patterson and co who have who've been so lethal going forward. And UCD tend to give away quite a few goals. So uh, I'm sure they will be... Uh, They'll be looking for a Galway win on Friday night. But those games are, are so difficult. Like in a, in a once-off game, the first goal is so important in, in those fixtures. And once you have something to to kind of latch on to and protect, you can you can maybe manage the game a bit a bit easier. But it's often a lottery. Sometimes momentum and form goes out the window and it just comes down to who actually shows up on the day. But uh UCD will fancy themselves, Raf, with, with the with the form they've shown, they tend to maybe start the season a little slower with the with the lack of experience they have. And they obviously had a number of players who were playing in the Premier Division for the first time. They've shown in the second half of the season that they're capable of picking up points and they're capable of putting good performances together on any given night. So if if they were to put it together on any uh, or on that night when, when that playoff comes around, they'll fancy themselves against either one of them. But you would imagine they would rather go away out of the two. Okay, and uh, we're going to turn our attention now to the women's national league. So, this was uh, a this culminated last weekend, and there were three teams left in the running. At one point, the week previous to that, there had been four teams in the running, but Shelburne have retained their title. And after the four nil win over Wexford, who were second uh, before kickoff, um, Siobhan Madigan was speaking to Captain Pearl Slattery, and then Noel Murray, Abby Larkin, and Heather O'Reilly. So, let's listen to some of the reaction. I think it's even nicer to win back to back because it's even harder and I think look last year was such a shock and a surprise I mean we knew last year going into the last game that if we would and they you know another team came out lost we could have but you didn't expect it we weren't prepared for it and then you flip it you know we're leading for a lot throughout the season but look we never knew we never thought that you'd le- we'd, we'd win it by massive amounts we've respect for the other teams in the league we're never going to let us do that and uh, look the last two we hit a bit of a dip everybody knew uh, we lost some players, we never made excuses, we just grown it, and that's why some of this group has they're phenomenal. The players waiting while those girls left to come in, they came in, did a job with young players come in, played our part. And when we hit the dip, we stuck together. Um, and then look, we were under a massive, massive pressure the last three weeks. We had to win every game against a tricky DLR side out on Home Farm, and then a tough Sligo side, which is, and then look to come down to Wexford under that pressure, about knowing if they won, they could win the league, and to score four goals, dominate the way we did, just unbelievably proud. Look, unbelievable performance from us all today. We had one thing in our mind to come down and do, and it was to beat Wexford down here. Each and every one stood out today. I think it was an absolute amazing performance for us and deserved to win. Glad it was us to get the first goal, and then I don't know what we had at half time, but second half was absolutely amazing. Do you know what? We've the best fans in the world. They came to Champions League, it was on the other side of the world as well. They're absolutely amazing. The two busfuls came down today, and everyone's family and friends. They're always the people we can count on. And you let it slip last year, but I'm sure you want to double now. 100%. That's the next thing in our mind. So we'll enjoy tonight and then back to training on Monday and get ready for uh, the cup final next weekend. Well done. Oh, I can't even explain it. It's actually amazing. We obviously came up here. We knew it was going to be a challenge, but we put the, everything in that we had and we got the result. Well, I'll tell you what, I didn't see this coming uh, in my life and in my career, but it's been such a wonderful adventure and addition. And, you know, I think coming into this year, I had this crazy idea that I wanted to play Champions League football. What I didn't know is, well, you know, how much I would love these players and the coaching staff and the community behind Shelburne. And, you know, I wanted to see out the year. If I was able to provide 1% of a lift, I'm happy that I got to contribute. So, uh, yeah, I mean... I love winning. I love winning. So another trophy I'm not going to complain about. I, uh, I'm just jumping on this Irish bandwagon right now. Ireland has a wonderful chance to get behind women's football. All right, so that's joyous scenes in Wexford as Shelburne celebrated a 4-0 win that sealed the title. So the last voice you heard there was former United States international Heather O'Reilly and then in reverse order, Abby Larkin, Noel Murray, and then the captain, Pearl Slattery. Jonathan, you were at the other game, Athlone versus Bohemians. And of course, uh, in that game, Athlone needed to uh, needed to win, which they did. And But they did need a draw between Shelburne and Wexford. And from Athlone's point of view, of course, that didn't happen. But 
at the other end, of course, Shelburne then dealt with the pressure as the the players alluded to there and held on to that lead at the top and to retain the title. So it's uh you know it's it's obviously a huge achievement for them. Yeah, no, it is. And, you know, there was a little bit of kind of flashbacks maybe to the last day of, of the Premier League kind of manic title race there between Liverpool and Man City where you had City behind and the pressure maybe on them. And obviously the, the results are going to be, go- or the scores are going to be back and forth. But Liverpool couldn't get on top while City were losing. They felt a little bit like this. It was both games were nil in at half time. Had that loan got maybe the goal that they deserved before half time, maybe would have put a, a tiny, tiny bit of kind of bit of doubt in, in the Shelburne's mindset. But they were just... They're such an experienced bunch of players and they just opened up by all accounts in the second half as well. But I think for Athlone, I think it's just, you know, it's not quite the fairy tale, um, but it's remarkable really when you just take a step back and, and look at their progress from, from last year. Only their third season in the league, they finished seventh last year, third from bottom. They flipped up to second this season, 37 points better off than this stage, the um, more tally of points than last season. Also, first cup final to come on Saturday. So, Tommy Hewitt's side, I think, and everyone involved in the club, they deserve huge, huge credit because that is some, that's the example now for all clubs that want to come across. You'll have Rovers in the league next year. You'll have a revamp Galway and hopefully there'll be more sides to come in the near future. But that's, if you're looking at a kind of a way to get forward and not just the results, the, the how well coached they are, in terms of their their possession football, their movement, they're 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 actually a great team to watch, and they'll give it all on 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 Sunday now as well in the cup final. Obviously, Shelburne will have to be hot favourites, the experience, and then a little bit of a bit between their teeth that they touched on in in those great post match interviews of that. So we're probably so emotional and and so euphoric in terms of the way they won the league last year that maybe they got caught in the hop a little bit with uh, losing the cup final. They'll want to try and get the double now and uh, and to skewer out and, and get another pot uh, for them. But I think it has the makings for a really, really good final. Both teams will go for it. And Athlone won't fear them. They've defeated Chels uh, recently and they're in right good form. Emily Corbett, her 20th goal of the season. Roger Malloy was exceptional on the right wing as well. Um, tidy players up and down. They're so comfortable in possession. But, uh, it, yes, really, really exciting final now, I have to say, on Sunday. Yeah, and it's going to be live on RT2 and the RT Player from 2.30pm and also live coverage on RT Radio 1 on Sunday Sport. You were speaking to the Athlone manager, Tommy Hewitt, after that win over Bohemians. Let's just listen to that, Jonathan. Tommy, not quite the uh, fairy tale that maybe many neutrals w- would have liked and uh, would have liked to have seen, but on the whole, it's been a remarkable breakthrough season from your side. Yeah, absolutely. Look, it's, it's a fairy tale for us. You know, just seeing the table there, we finished second, two points behind Shelburne, who were worldly champions because whoever wins the league is always a worldly champion. Um, but tonight, the girls at thought were ex- excellent again tonight. Could have been a little bit more than 2 1. In fairness, the boys came back into it after one all, but uh, no, our girls absolutely immense. Now we can look forward to the cup final. All the pressure's on Shelburne, I feel. Um, you know, we'll be massive underdogs going into it, but uh, we'll go there and we'll enjoy it and we'll compete. Yeah, so that is Athlone Town manager Tommy Hewitt uh, taking the uh, the underdogs tag and pinning it to his collar uh, <laughs> very readily there, Jonathan. So um, yeah. that is going to be key for them, obviously. As, as you said, Shelburne are going to be clear favourites as league champions, albeit they only beat Athlone by two points in the end. But especially when we look at the, I suppose, the difference in experience in a showpiece final like this, they'll have to take any little advantage they can. Oh, absolutely. I think we all smirked when we heard Tommy's line there, just getting that out early. That's only, it was only shortly after full time last week as well. So you can imagine the uh, motivation tricks uh, during the week. But he also made a good point also, like, well, this um, title charge almost came from, with the greatest respect, out of nowhere. Nobody, like you'd speak to Tommy earlier in the year and despite them being relatively close and within touch and distance, say, on the tally on the table, it was always like, no, 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 we're too far behind. We, we're not going to, we're not in this. Uh, they changed to towards the end then where we need a, we're going to need a miracle. But the way that they've dealt with the pressure in the last couple of games after since they bet Wexford, and that was the kind of the result that really, for the second time after the cup um, semi-final victory, they bet them again um, seven days later. And that was the one that kind of put them within the touch and distance. And then you had a couple of other results that kind of went astray uh, for them and in their favour. But they've had to deal with pressure. And they've I think it's done beating at seven now. And the last couple of victories, you know, Galway last week, uh, Bowes this this week as well. 
they're just they're those hard fought games. You have to deal with the pressure of trying to win those, and that's going to set them up in good stead, I think, for the for the cup final as well, because they've got like a a mini little practice couple of games here in, in dealing with that type of sp- uh, pressurized environment, and and they've performed well uh, throughout those. So that's been a little advantage. He's also touched on as well. A couple of the players um, would have played in kind of high profile. Gaelic football games as well, all Ireland games, and you even see Laurie Laurie Ryan now has a clash, uh, unfortunately, with our ladies' football game for for a club as well. It's just maddens me, but I won't go off on a tangent how um, sporting bodies can't come together and just when there's a free week there of just making things happen. But anyways, we f- focus on the cup final. But they've had you know players that have done. Well, you know, they mightn't necessarily have, you know, experience in this game at higher level games. They have been well served over the course of that league campaign and kind of previous other sports as well. So I don't think I don't think they'll fear anything. Um they'll they're they're gonna take a lot into it, but you'd still have to look at the cold heart, raw experience in greater abundance and have been there and done that from an all king side, even despite the the avalanche of players that they've lost over the course of the season in particular and in recent years, there's still a lot of kind of raw experience. Like you look down the spine of the team there, Pearl at the back, uh, plenty of options in midfield as well. Heather Riley up top, Noel Murray, one of the most skillful players in the, in the league. Uh, Abby Larkin is going to be an absolute superstar. And since she's gone central as well, it's been a real revelation, I feel as well. So you probably feel that, Shelburne will just about have a little bit too much for them, but I think I think it has, as I touched on earlier, it has the makings of being a good game. And particularly, you just hope from a loan perspective is that they do themselves justice on the big occasion, uh, and that they go on and uh, we'll hopefully all be watching as neutrals and uh, seeing which way it ends up in the end. Yeah, we might talk about the head to heads very shortly, but let's just listen to Noel King, the Shelburne manager. So our colleague Anthony Pine was at the media launch or media day for the for the cup final yesterday, and uh, this is what Noel King had to say. Everybody, you don't you get to a final. It's, finals are brilliant. Yeah, it's in talent. It'll be a big occasion. Uh, new experience for some of the girls. A second, uh, we were there last year and we got beaten. So as Pearl would say, there's unfinished business, and uh, if you can get a double on it. Then, be fantastic. Big occasion down in Wexford. We had uh, five bus loads went down. Uh, I don't think that's ever been seen for an away game, certainly in women's football, maybe not even in men's football. Uh, the atmosphere after was terrific. And the natural follow on then is that you want to try and win the, win the cup again. I don't have the same. Yeah, and in regards to the head-to-heads between Shelburne and Athlone, so Athlone won the last meeting 2-0 in September, um, a home match for them there, and then they drew 1-1 in July, and then Shells won the opening game between them in March uh, by a 2-0 scoreline as well. So when you actually look at it that way, obviously there's a there's a difference in terms of experience and in terms of the levels these players uh, on either set of players have got to, but when you actually read the uh, the head to heads, Jonathan, it's a lot tighter between them. Yeah, look, you, you just remind yourself like uh, of those permutations. Like, had that Wexford Shells game finished a draw, the head to head was the next come in play, and and it's bang even between the two sides. Hence, there would have been a, a potential uh, playoff. So, just to give you an indication, really, more of of the growth that Lo- at loan have been on o- over the in, re- in recent years, particularly highlighted in this year and look they're not they're not going to fear Shelburne they'll still play their their passing beautiful passing movement um the second goal like uh and a daily mount at the weekend was was pure evidence of that it's a I called it a long ball I was corrected quickly a directional ball from the keeper up to the center forward out to the left move back in and and a beautiful finish at, at the back post it was their opening goal in fact and you know the, they have that in abundance and they create a number of other opportunities uh, Madison Gibson as well as dangerous on the, on, the, on the left wing so they have players there that will potentially have the uh, ask question marks of Shell as well so um, both sides and Shelburne as well they like to play ball as well so like it's it's not as if a case is going to be you know spoke about other managers maybe going a little bit more direct at, at times but these teams do like to pass and move pass and move and that's just another little tangent of uh, of, a, of, a, of a fascinating battle ahead yeah, it's always safe to go with long pass, I think, and try and, <laughs> and drill directional that one ball in. Is the, is or direct, or directional ball. ball. I think it, it, it just the, reminds me. The keeper me. played it perfectly to the centre forward. That's where it all is. No, yeah. no matter what we describe it, it, it was a beautiful pass. It just reminds me of a time uh, on another podcast elsewhere where Mark Kinsler quickly corrected me when I went long ball. You remember the, the game against Germany in uh, the O two World Cup where 
It was, a, it was a long pass, in fairness. Up to Niall <laughs> Quinn, headed down. Robbie Keane scores uh, the late goal. I won't make that mistake again. In fairness, he, he said it in jest as well. But anyway, before we go, obviously we were talking about uh, Liverpool and Spurs at the weekend, but there are other big games, of course, as well. And one of them, obviously, is uh, Chelsea against Arsenal. So Arsenal leading, uh, leading the Premier League at the moment. And Chelsea off the back of a well, obviously they're in Champions League action tonight, so they may they may bounce back. But a, a surprise defeat to Brighton by a by a four one scoreline, Paul. I mean, they the, they hadn't lost under Graham Potter since he'd come in, but that just throws a little bit of doubt there. That result, albeit against his uh, his former team, who maybe had something to try and prove. Yeah, and they were desperate on the weekend, Raph. They they could have been three or four down within the first half an hour. And so many uncharacteristic mistakes, particularly from Thiago Silva, who coughed up the ball on a number of occasions trying to play out from the back. They did a piece of match of the day the other night and highlighted maybe some of the, the gaps that were exposed from Brighton, particularly down through through the middle of the pitch. And um yeah, it was it was slightly Worrying performance. I'm sure Graham Potter couldn't wait to get out of the place because he didn't seem to get too too good a reception, and uh, that defeat would have hurt. But I mean, by and large, they've been they've been quite good since he's gone in there. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he just rested up the bodies tonight. They're already guaranteed top place within their Champions League group, and he'll focus particularly on that game on Sunday against Arsenal. Um, Arsenal are banging form. Chelsea's form at Stamford Bridge down through the years has been particularly good. So. I'm sure he'll fancy taking a little pop off Arsenal. I know they were good against Nottingham Forest, but maybe in uh, in the week gone by, I think it was the Southampton game where they maybe just showed that there was one or two gaps that that Chelsea could expose. But um, it is it, it's it's quite important that they get something from that game. I read only this morning it was a headline: Graham Potter saying, "You know, you're only ninety minutes away from a catastrophe within." Uh, a managerial position and that's just how crazy football has become so I'm sure he'll be fully focused on on getting a positive result because their last game is, is Newcastle which is another team that seems to be in contention for those top four spots so um, I'm sure he's keen to kind of get back to to winning ways and, and how they have been performing in recent weeks but the defeat against Brighton was was very uncharacteristic so maybe just evidence to the toll that the number of games the top teams are having to play takes on 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 certain players and on certain teams. So, uh, yeah, it's an important fixture. Chelsea have done well against Arsenal in years gone by. I'll hang my hat in a Chelsea win this weekend, Ralph. Um, and then there's Newcastle, of course, as well, um, which we, uh, we we should we should mention, of course, because uh, as uh, as Paul you said there, they've uh, they put themselves into that mix for the top four. And I guess Conan, before we go, uh. The the obviously look it's it's not a very organic process they've uh, they've they've had the takeover there was always a sense that it was going to follow on from how what happened with Chelsea many years ago and then City as well that they will start to contend but it seems to be coming a lot more quickly than many people would have expected. Yeah, but they have a very very good young manager Eddie Howe, who's done uh, who I rate very very highly. Um. Five wins out of their last six, three clean sheets out of their last four. Um, yeah, they're doing their talking on the pitch as, as footballers. Um, I think that if you look, we could go in about their owners a bit uh, into detail, and we'd probably spend another hour talking about that. So I'll uh, I won't. Um, but it was a, a fantastic victory over the, at the weekend over Aston Villa. Thought they played really, really well. They started the game very, very strongly. Um, obviously got the penalty from from Callum Wilson um, just on the stroke of half time, which was an important time to get it because he scored another one then shortly after half time to to put put the icing on the cake with a half an hour to go. And um, Joe Linton has been doing really well. Um, Almiron's done done really really well at the club. So he's the players that he has that has been at the club before him that weren't shining. He has managed to 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 get. Um, playing really, really well for him. Um, but Bruno Grimash, Grimash, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it. Paul, will you pronounce it? I think. <laughs> <laughs> he's a good player. <laughs> yeah, he's a good player. That Bruno lad. <laughs> no, he's a, he's a, no, he's a very, very good player. Um, and he's going to be the player that I think a lot of clubs are going to try to sign. Um, maybe not at Christmas time, he won't be allowed to leave. Uh, um, but next summer, there'll be a lot of interest in him. Um, but Newcastle have the have the finances to keep him at the club if he wants to 
if he wants to stay there and if that's his main motivation. But um, it's uh, they are attractive to watch this season. It, it makes me very, uh, it's hard for me to say that, but um, yeah, they are an attractive team to watch. Yeah, and just a, a final point on that, actually, Conan, is you mentioned Joe Linton, for example. Obviously, Almiron was somebody who I think even Jack Grealish made a bit of a dig at at the end of last season, but um, I think he was a little bit worse for wear when he said what he said. <laughs> um, but in, in regards to Joe Linton, though, uh, you know, this was a player that had been bought as a striker, didn't quite do the job on that front, but it's it takes a bit of presence of mind to actually maybe look at a player who may be nailed on a certain position and then, you know, actually maybe work out that actually there is a role for him in a completely, you know, as a sort of box to box midfielder and maybe nobody else would have seen it coming, but obviously um, it's, it's testament to Eddie Howe and his staff that they, uh, that they were able, able to spot that and then kind of implement it into this position. Yeah. That's the sign of a good manager. I, I think that you can, you're able to see a player, um, perform it possibly on the training ground in those small sided games and be able to say, well, do you know what? I actually think that you'd be better fitted in this position in this, in, in tactically in my team. And that's what he's done this season. As you say, he's done really, really well in that midfield area. He gets into the box. He's, he's dynamic. He's fit. Um, he got his first goal of the season, obviously at, at the weekend, first league goal. Um, and I think a lot of people are starting to take notice of him now because it, it was a case that he was playing up front and, the ball was bouncing off and he's not great with his back to goal um, in terms of Premier League standard. So when he's driving at players is when he's he's done really, really well. And when you get the ball at his feet and he gets the chance to turn, that's when he creates chances for his for his teammates around him. And he's shown that this season. He's done really, really well. Yeah, we'll see how Newcastle progress. Um, obviously, a lot of that will be after the World Cup, which is only uh, was it two and a half weeks away or so. So not very far away. We'll obviously be building up to uh, that tournament and it, it's all, all the matches are going to be live on RT2 and the RT player. But of course, the, the big match this weekend on Sunday is going to be the Women's FAI Cup final live on RT2 and RT player and also RT Radio 1's Sunday Sport. So that brings us to an end. Jonathan Higgins, thanks for coming on this week. And also Conan and Paul... Uh, thanks for uh, t- thanks for taking the time. <laughs>